1941, the Second World War is devastating. The Axis, British, and the Soviets are all fighting while America is neutral. In December, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor and the United States declares war on Japan in response. A war in the Pacific begins. In our timeline, Hitler and Mussolini declared war on the United States for no logical reason, to help a Japan who never seriously cared about the Axis Pact. But what if they had left Japan to fight the United States alone? We now have two separate world wars, the USA against Japan in the Pacific, and the war in Europe. In the Pacific, the war ends with an American victory. U.S. forces invade Japan in 1946 using another seven atomic bombs, apart from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But in Europe, things are different. Without an American direct intervention, there is no landing in Normandy. Italians hold on in Libya. Germans do not face serious hassles in the West, and are thus able to stop the Soviets somewhere in Ukraine. The war became a gigantic and bloody stalemate. Bombings of cities, enormous losses on the Eastern Front, nobody moves an inch. So in May 1946, everyone has had enough, and there is a peace conference that ends the war. Germany is the real winner of the war, as the Axis occupy almost all of Europe. Germany obtains part of Poland, Luxembourg, and Alsace. Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, and the Baltic states are independent but fall into the German sphere of influence. Yugoslavia is dismembered. Pétain remains head of France, close to the Axis. Several European countries have pro-Axis governments. In Belgium and the Netherlands, the pre-war governments are restored, but they have to stay neutral. Japan loses all their foreign territories. No Soviet intervention in Manchuria, so Korea is united under U.S. influence. The two world wars are over. The world is divided into three blocs. The Communist bloc, Soviet Union, and China. The Allies, led by the United States of America and the United Kingdom. And the Axis in Europe. A cold war between the three blocs soon starts. In the following years, Germany becomes the second world power after the United States. Hitler rules over Europe. The German economy and industry is growing while its army keeps Eastern Europe under its grip. In Asia, the Chinese Civil War ends in 1951 with a communist Maoist victory. India becomes independent in 1947. Japan and Germany are not close allies, so Subhas Chandra Bose remains in Berlin and does not die in 1945. In 1948, he becomes the Prime Minister of an Axis-friendly India. Other British colonies gain independence. Indonesia is also independent. There is tension in the world. Discontent in the Eastern European countries under German rule. The truce between the Soviets and the Germans is in a state of tension. The USA is in conflict with German mercantilism, in a similar way that they are with China in our timeline. On several occasions, the world was on edge of another world war. In 1946, the Soviet Union refused to withdraw from Persia. Germany, Italy, and Britain sent an expeditionary force. This was the only time Axis and British troops fought together. The Soviets accept a withdrawal. In 1947, Stalin is overthrown and executed at the end of a brief civil war. His popularity was eroded by what was seen as a defeat in the Second World War. Khrushchev becomes the first secretary. The Chinese invade Taiwan and Hainan in January 1952. In 1952, there was an uprising in Warsaw against the Polish general government and its German occupiers, which were crushed by German forces. The Indo-Pakistani War of 1947 begins. Berlin provides military assistance to India and sends submarines into the Arabian Sea. Gandhi is killed in 1949 by an Indian nationalist. The Suez Crisis, 1956. Following the nationalization of the Suez Canal by President Nasser, the United Kingdom invades Egypt, but they are forced to withdraw after a German intervention. The Algerian Revolution in 1956 is crushed by the French with the help of their German ally. In 1957, the Americans invade Cuba, ending the Cuban Revolution and capturing Castro. The Americans cannot lose that island now that they have no influence over Europe. In 1958, the military dictatorship of Venezuela is overthrown and a pro-German government is installed. In 1958, the Germans shot down a U-2 spy plane over the Ruhr with a surface-to-air missile. 
reciprocated after a few months by the Americans with the shooting down of a German Horten Ho 11 spy plane near Terra Nova. There was even a Cuban-style missile crisis between Germany and the USA and Iceland in 1958. The United States began deploying their Jupiter missiles with a range of 2,400 kilometers in the UK. Hitler responds with the deployment of nukes in Iceland. The American President MacArthur ordered a naval blockade on the island. In the end, there was an agreement to pull out the Jupiter missiles in the UK in exchange for Germans removing their missiles from Iceland. The US did not care much of those missiles. The Jupiters were a pain to operate and maintain, and the United Kingdom is already the largest military base for the United States on the planet. Hitler too doesn't care about the missiles in Iceland. Germany from the 1950s had nuclear missiles on their U-boats. Indeed, the world is not ready for a new war. America is isolationist. After the too many losses during the invasion of Japan, the Soviets lost 30 million men during the fight with the Axis. The UK, Italy, France, and other European countries rose from the ashes of World War II with a destroyed economy. Germany is occupied to organize its new Lebensraum Empire in the East. It's 1960. The 71-year-old Hitler and 77-year-old Mussolini are the leaders of their respective countries. At Hitler's side, there is still the old guard. Himmler, acting as a second-in-command, is followed by Goebbels, Bormann, and Donitz. New to the inner circle is Arthur Axman, former leader of the Hitler Youth, and Gudrun Himmler, daughter of Heinrich Himmler. Goring died in 1953 due to liver cancer. The American president was MacArthur, who was succeeded in the 1960 election by Kennedy. Hitler perceives Kennedy as weak and ineffectual because of his relative youth. In the Soviet Union, Khrushchev pursues a more liberal domestic and foreign policy, searching for collaboration with the West. The relationship with Germany is uneasy, and the vast majority of the Red Army and their missiles are deployed along the Iron Curtain. The Axis has also expanded into an economic union, not only a military alliance. Acting similarly to the EU in our timeline, but it's not the bureaucratic, bank-dominated nightmare we see today. It's more like to each his own, but within the alliance there's minor collaboration. Sweden, Spain, and Turkey will have joined the Axis. Portugal joined too, after the assassination of Salazar in 1953. France is a member of the Axis, but its foreign policy is quite independent from Germany, with Jacques Doriot as the Prime Minister. Switzerland, Belgium, and the Netherlands are not members of the Axis, but have good relations with Germany. When a superpower that a decade before steamrolled Europe is right at your gates, it's risky to have a bad relationship with them. Decolonization has been slowed. In 1960, the European powers will still have their African colonies. After America, other countries developed nuclear weapons. Germany first, then the Soviets, United Kingdom, and France. Hitler never liked atomic technology, and despite the high power and quality of the German nukes, their numbers would remain limited. The United States would hold a significant advantage in the number of nukes it has. However, most of them would be low-yield tactical nukes, Hiroshima-style. In this timeline, the USA is less powerful. Germany conducted its first hydrogen bomb explosion test in 1954 in the Svalbard. The situation on the field in 1960. Uniforms, artillery, and equipment for the infantrymen are not much changed from World War II. The U.S. is still using the M1 Garand and the M14 as its main battle rifle. The Russians are receiving AK-47s in great numbers. The Wehrmacht, beside their dear MG machine gun, has the Gavia Model 3. The Soviets have the largest land army in the world, however the Axis Alliance altogether are not so far. The German army fields 900,000 men, 150,000 in the Navy, 170 in the Waffen-SS, and 500,000 in the Luftwaffe. The Germans' main tanks are the Jaguar heavy tank, 72 tons, 9 meters long, main armament is a 152mm gun and a leopard but with a 120mm gun. The Soviets have the T-54 tanks but there is need to counter the heavy German tanks so the main tank is the T-10, a 62 ton tank. The ICU-152 is still in service. 
For the same reason, the main USA tank is the M103 heavy tank, and the main British tank is the FV214 Conqueror. The USA also has the M47 and the first M48. The Italians, as well as most of the Axis countries, have adopted the German Leopard. The French developed the AMX-50. The USA is by far the largest navy, numerical superiority in all types except for submarines, Germany. In aircraft, the Germans had the Messerschmitt Me-464, the best fighter of all time. The Soviets have the MiG-17, and the US has the F-104, the F-86 Sabre, and the F-100. The Germans are the only ones that have ICBMs, although not in great numbers, and solid-fueled SLBM missiles capable of being launched from submarines. Rocket technology is not easy, and the V-2 project was almost as expensive as the Manhattan Project. Now Nazi Germany is a decade ahead of any other nation in this field. In our timeline, both the USA and the Soviets relied on captured German scientists to kickstart their missile research, the Operation Paperclip. This does not happen in this timeline. In 1960, the USA are just beginning their first generations of Atlas ICBM. However, the USA and the Soviets have bombers. The USA has thousands of long-range B-52, B-47s, and F-105s that could hit Europe from Britain. The Soviets have around 400 bombers. The IL-28, the Tu-16, the Tu-4, a copy of the American B-29, and the first Tu-95M, the Bear. The Luftwaffe has the heavy bomber Hainkill HE-507, range 15,000 kilometers. The United States is the main world power. The war solved their economical problems, and most of the former British Empire fell into the sphere of influence. But they are not the global leading power as they are today. The USA have to face a far greater, more technologically advanced, and more dedicated rival than it ever had in the USSR. Trade between Europe and the US is limited, so the US is running low on major custom. They are forced to open trade negotiations with other less developed countries, lowering its GDP. Germany uses its wealth and power to influence parts of South America, making the list of US allies thinner. Argentina always was an Axis sympathizer. Other South American governments are receptive to the Nazis by having similar authoritarian type of governments. South Africa became an ally of Germany. Saudi Arabia is in the American sphere, but the oil of the Middle East, Iraq, Persia, Libya, is owned by European corporations. The oil negotiated in Deutschmark, instead of dollars, is a massive boon for Germany. With the European colonial empires still existing, the American hegemony is at risk. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union has continued producing hordes of tanks, and the British economy has recovered. They were almost the only beneficiary of the Marshall Plan. The world is now ready. All it needs is a spark. In 1948, in Vietnam, a war began between French forces against the Viet Minh, led by Ho Chi Minh. The Germans intervened in this war being French allied, trying to gain control part of Indochina, as the Americans did in our timeline. The war rapidly became an armed conflict between South Vietnam and the Germans on one side, North Vietnam held by the Soviets, China, United Kingdom, and the United States of America on the other side. In 1960, the Germans invaded North Vietnam, causing China to enter the war. Using tens of nukes, the Germans forced the Chinese to retreat, and the Vietnam War ended in October 1960. Another victory for the Wehrmacht, another gigantic parade in the center of Berlin. But this war had a cost. The German nuclear arsenal is now depleted. A consistent part of the Luftwaffe and some of its best Waffen SS units are in Vietnam. Three out of the eight Kriegsmarine aircraft carriers are in Vietnamese waters, two oceans far from the fatherland. The European defenses are weakened. The Soviets and the USA both know it. November 30th, 1960, eight Soviet armies with six million men and thousands of tanks moved to the Polish border. The USA and the UK accused Germany of using chemical weapons and napalm in Vietnam and announced a naval blockade to impede further hostilities in Indochina. Axis countries start the mobilization. In this atmosphere, an incident is only a matter of time. The clock starts ticking.
Berlin sent their submarines to patrol the Atlantic. December 13th, the USS Saratoga fleet encircles a German submarine off the coast of Miami and has the great idea to drop death charges on this nuclear-armed submarine to try to make it surface. These are small explosives which in theory can damage the submarine. However, on board, the submarine is not at all in the clear. The German commander has the order to defend itself, if attacked. The submarine has a torpedo with a 15 kiloton nuclear warhead, the G9. It was intended to destroy naval bases and coastal towns, and more importantly, carriers. He orders the launch. After a few minutes, an American carrier group is vaporized. In the most charged and hostile moment of the Cold War, a nuclear blast erupts right off the coast of Florida. The explosion causes a massive tsunami with a reach of 10 meters. High waves in South Florida. Americans believe that they are under attack. In 1960, the United States of America had no plans for a gradual escalation situation. There was only one response, massive retaliation. General Curtis Lee May, United States Air Force Chief of Staff, is driving hard to use nukes and has quite a lot of support for this. December 13, 1960, Kennedy gives the order to launch the nuclear arsenal. There are B-52s constantly in the air rotation. Other B-52s and B-47s leave their bases from the USA. The F-105s and the missiles in the United Kingdom deliver their nukes on all the Axis countries. The European capitals and the main cities, harbors, industrial zones from Lisboa to Helsinki are hit. Hitler sees the explosions from his bunkers. No doubts on what he will do next. In the evening, there are 17 thermonuclear explosions on US soil. The German ICBM fall on New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Houston, Detroit, San Antonio, Cleveland, San Diego, Dallas, St. Louis, San Francisco, New Orleans, Seattle, Buffalo, Cincinnati, Denver, and Minneapolis. The German U-boat U-725, a Type 25 submarine carrying eight missiles with 250 kiloton warheads, more than 10 times the size of Hiroshima, receives a launch order. Boston, Norfolk, Baltimore, Charlotte, Atlanta, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Washington, the Pentagon is gone. The medium-range missiles V-4s are used to hit Britain. The USA military bases of Scranton, Waddington, Lake and Health, Alcabury are destroyed. The Soviets are a threat. They cannot be spared. The German nuclear doctrine of the time consists in converting a zone east of the border into a nuclear wasteland to prevent the Soviet army from advancing further westward. The same tactic used in Vietnam against the Chinese. In Moscow, Leningrad, Stalingrad, Baku, Gorky, Odessa, Novosibirsk, and the Soviets' missiles and air bases are chosen as targets. Khrushchev didn't want a war. He escalated the crisis to show how tough he was in the face of Nazis, hoping that the various nationalities and ethnic groups in the East would rise up against the Nazis. But now he has no other choice to retaliate. The Soviet bombers leave the airport. The Soviets have also the R-5 Pobeda, a ballistic missile with a range of 1,200 kilometers, and the Scud A carrying a nuclear warhead with a range of 190 kilometers. They are meant to be used tactically, to blow a hole in the defensive line and advance through it. This is nuclear war, and it'll be exactly as you imagine it to be. After the first 48 hours, there is an undeclared truce. The contendents look at the damages received. All the leaders involved are safe inside their bunkers. Americans want to continue the fight. They see this war as an opportunity to resolve the issue of Germany once and for all. But Kennedy understands that the war must be over immediately and offers a ceasefire to Hitler. The situation in the country is serious and there would be nothing else to gain apart from another half dozen incinerated cities. Kennedy was not well informed about the real nuclear capabilities of Germany. He only orders military interventions in South America to overthrow not friendly governments. The Soviets continued the ground offensive for a while, but they had logistical problems even before the bombings. Add high casualties since the first hours of the conflict, limited war stocks, decimated command structures, and air forces have been sized. Hitler is not so keen to accept the peace treaty. 
nukes your city destroyers not so effective against military targets, so the Axis military power is intact, vast reserves and weapons. But Viper, Meyer, and other generals expressed enormous doubts on the continuation of a war that would become rapidly a trench warfare situation in a radioactive chemical landscape. And for once, Hitler agrees with the generals. A truce with the return to the status quo of anti-bombs designed before Christmas. The final bill of the war is around 25 million deaths in the US, Europe with around maybe 40 million deaths, 20 million deaths in the Soviet regions. USA had 25 cities destroyed. Canada, Australia, and other US allies are untouched. The Germans had limited numbers of nukes and missiles. The United Kingdom received four bombs on their military bases and replied with their V-bombers destroying four German bases, Pianamunda being one of them. In such a scenario, an escalation is the last thing they want. The Soviet Union lost the main cities and white parts of the western border are now a radioactive wasteland. The German forces in Indochina are left in peace. The Germans have around their 100,000 men, most of them elite units. Any attempt at invasion would be a disaster, plus tactical nuclear weapons which will be used to greet the marines upon landing. Europe has been hit the hardest. Around 400 targets have been hit. Many key cities are destroyed, as well as industrial and military areas. Berlin is hit by several nukes. Waste areas will be uninhabitable for 20 to 30 years. However, this war will not cause the end of Europe, nor the world. Around 400 weapons are needed to cripple the Soviet economy and military as a political, economic, and military entity, more than double for the USA and Europe. The Axis did not have the necessary amount of nukes, the Soviets did not have the necessary amount of bombers, and the USA did not find it convenient to continue the war. Penetrating the European defenses was not a walk in the park. The Axis has an air defense network of over 3,000 interceptors and thousands of surface-to-air missile sites. Very few Soviet bombers were able to drop their weapons on target. Part of their bomber force was destroyed on the ground during Germany's first nuclear strike. American bombers suffered terrific losses over the well-protected areas. Ruhr, Berlin region, North Italy, and Normandy. The majority of the U.S. bombs had yields in the range of those used at Nagasaki. Such a bomb does about the same amount of damage as a large conventional air raid. The United States had to drop 3 to 10 bombs on each city targeted, depending on size. A B-47 could drop 28 nukes. As a result, there is no nuclear holocaust, and the war greatly resembles the destruction of World War II, except for the radiations that will continue to linger and kill people for years. Germany had anti-atomic shelters for most of its citizens, as in Switzerland in our timeline, so most of the population survived. However, millions of people are left homeless. Europe will rebuild, as it always did after a war. Same as the USA, but the world has been changed. The nuclear war produced enormous industrial fires, and millions of tons of smoke and chemicals rise into the substratosphere, blocking significant sunlight from reaching Earth's surface. Cold grips the earth, lowering global temperatures by 4 to 5 degrees Celsius and eliminating the growing season for at least two years. There will be starvation in the less developed countries in Asia and Africa. Cancer and diseases will be problems for the next generations. There will be shortages of everything, turmoil, rebellions, strong leaders will be elected. While the USA and European nations reconstruct their power and rearm frantically, new powers will rise up. China, who washed their hands of this conflict, and India will start the struggle for leadership in Asia, with Indonesia and Japan as regional powers. Brazil becomes the main power of South America by default. Australia and Canada, untouched by the war, will absorb part of the strength and population of America and the United Kingdom. The leaders. Kennedy will not be killed at Dallas, only because Dallas has been cancelled with a thermonuclear bomb. He will be shot somewhere else. The conspiracy theorists say that someone did not forgive him for the end of the war. Khrushchev will be removed. There is a need for a hardliner. Maybe Alexander Shelepin, causing a rapprochement with China. Hitler and Mussolini are nearly 80 years old. They'll die soon, and new leaders will rise. So, a totally new world. New situations, ideas, new stories, difficult to even imagine and for sure, new wars. It seems humans don't want safety, comfort, and short working hours. They also want drums, parades, flags, and struggles.